got your mic. Good afternoon. It is Tuesday, June the 6th. The time is 3 p.m. and I'm calling the uh, Amherst County Board of Supervisors meeting to order. Uh, the first thing on our agenda is actual approval of the agenda. Board, is there a motion? So moved. Motion on the floor by Mr. Pugh. Are there any comments? If not, signify by saying aye. 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 I vote aye. <coughs> uh, if you would, uh, please stand and join me in the invocation, which I shall lead, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Mr. Ayers. <clears throat> our Father and our God, Lord, we humbly come before you as your servants. Lord, we just ask for wisdom on this board as we do the county's business. Uh, Father, we lift up. Uh, the greatest generation to you today, Lord, uh, 79 years a day, 79 years ago today, Lord, as they uh, stormed the beaches of Normandy on D-Day, Lord, as they uh, were going to liberate uh, those who were, uh, just couldn't take care of themselves at the time, Father. And we just thank you for those uh, men and women, and we thank you for our men and women in the armed services today, our fire and EMS personnel, and our law enforcement. Father, thank you for all of our county employees, and we ask these things in your name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> we will move on to the citizen comment portion of our agenda. Uh, when you come forward, please state your name, your district of residence, and you will be given three minutes to address the board. At the end of three minutes, I'll ask you to wrap your comments up, and we'll move on to the next speaker. The first person that is signed up is Chris McCloud. Good afternoon. I'm Chris McLeod, P.O. Box 784, Buckhannon, Virginia 24066. I am the lieutenant, first lieutenant commander of the Finn Castle Rifles 1326, Sons of Confederate Veterans Roanoke. I am also the third brigade commander, Virginia Division, Sons of Confederate Veterans, and I represent the citizens of this county that are SCV members. I come here in absolute and complete opposition to any altercations, alterations, changes, moving and or removing of the Confederate Memorial here in this county. It is unfortunate that we live in a time where individuals somehow believe that they can fix the problems and woes of the 21st century by attacking monuments that were erected in the first part of the 20th century to honor the men of the 19th century. We live on a continent where slavery existed for 224 years. However, the Confederacy only existed for four of those and collects all the blame. Now, I may not be a mathematician, but I can tell you when the blame game just doesn't add up. Leave this memorial alone. We come here on the 6th of June. What happens when someone then gets offended about that flag right there that flew over slavery the longest and also flew over segregation and demands that you remove it from all facilities and all county properties? This needs to stop. We need to put an end to this. Do not allow this to happen because somebody's going to get offended. They will manufacture something to be offended about, no matter what it may be. You cannot satisfy everybody all the time. Do not open this Pandora's box because it will lead to other monuments and memorials from other wars and other conflicts to be targeted. Put a stop to it. They're trying to erase our history and our past, which will lead to us not having a future because you cannot know exactly how far you come if you do not know where you came from. Please, leave this memorial alone. Thank you. Have a good day. Wow. <clears throat> Carter Gill. Good afternoon to the Amherst County Board of uh, Supervisors. My name is Carter T. Gill. I live at 2479 Trinity Road, Troutville, Virginia. 
I'm a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Air Force. I was command pilot of the C-130 Hercules who flew 35 combat missions in Vietnam. I volunteered to put my life on the line for the United States of America in Vietnam. My brother also put his life on the line for the United States of America in World War II as a crew chief of the B-29 bomber in the Pacific. My father worked his fingers to the bone at Camp Pickett to help the cause during World War II. My great-great-grandfather put his life on the line for the state of Virginia, where we live. He rose to the highest enlisted rank in the Army of Northern Virginia. He left his small family and wife at home while he went out to fight for the state of Virginia. He had no slaves. He had no slaves. My mother and father taught me to be proud of my Southern heritage. I do not need the Roanoke Times editorial department or some woke, biased member of the NAACP to tell me who to honor and be proud of as a Virginian and a veteran. Remember, if it had not been for the Southern men and women fighting in World War I and II, you'd be speaking German and uh, Japanese today. I count my blessings and thank God that I was born a Southern man with Southern values. I do not need you or anyone else to tell me what is a noble cause. This country's proud veterans will not allow the Amherst County Board of Directors and the NAACP to paint our Southern soldiers as racist men and women. Do not go down that road. Amherst County administrators, do not desecrate the monuments to these brave women. As a Vietnam veteran, I know that the Vietnam War was not popular. When I came home, I was called a baby killer. What is the next step in this woke government of tip to change history and how we feel about our veterans and brand them as criminals? Are you going to put a plaque by my name when I'm gone that says I was a baby killer because I fought for this country in Vietnam? I don't think the American veterans will stand for that being done or anything like that. I strongly suggest that the Amherst County Board of Supervisors stay out of the business of branding Virginia Civil War heroes and honorable soldiers and men as anything but honorable. I strongly suggest that the Amherst County Board of, of Supervisors stay out of the business of branding Virginia Civil War veterans as anything honorable other than honorable men and soldiers. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Gill. Samuel Bryant. <sighs> Chairman Board, I uh, just wanted to speak with you today about the monument at the courthouse and just give some history of Amherst County. Uh, Amherst County in the Civil War, in proportion to its population, no county in Virginia furnished more men to defend its soil and sovereignty in the war between the states than Amherst County. Uh, the citizens began to enlist Governor Letcher's first call for troops, and in the last year of the war, old men left their homes and farms and were lads laid down their books and left their schools to swell the ranks. I'd like to remember everyone here, this is a time where there was individual state rights for slavery, um, not every state was the same. And if you want to know what our men in Amherst County did, there were six companies of infantry, one cavalry, one light infantry, and two heavy artillery. All but the heavy artillery companies left Amherst in 1861. What did these soldiers in Amherst County have in common? They fought the battles. They died in combat. They perished from wounds and disease. They suffered the provisions of primitive living conditions, poor food, equipment shortages, and rough and rapid marches, and often in miserable weather. Uh, I honor these men. I'm a citizen soldier. I spent 20 years in the Army. I've worked both in local, state, and federal government. You guys all know it. Um, I don't think this monument or the plaque is hurting anyone. Those are my personal beliefs with respect to all people. Um, I have taken care of all people of all nationality, and the only color we have in common is the color of blood, and that's red. Um, these men don't go forgetting, and the families and the hurt and the sacrifice should never be forgotten. So please remember that and the important decisions you have to make in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Linda Corasi. Did I say that right? Okay. 
Good afternoon. I am reading this for Philip Hamilton because he's unable. Members of the Amherst County Board of Supervisors, I'm reaching out to you in response to the Amherst County NAACP chapter, which has sent your board a letter claiming that Amherst County Confederate Monument is throwback to an era of institutional racism. As the owner of HamiltonHistoricalRecords.com and as a candidate for a public office, I am against the varied efforts of removing historical statues, monuments, and historical markers in our Commonwealth. In 1922, the Dr. John Thompson chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy erected the monument in front of the Amherst County Courthouse to honor the Amherst men who mustered at the courthouse to fight at the courthouse to fight for Southern independence. This dedication was not done to support racism, but rather to honor the men who fought and died in the war between the states. There is evidence of Confederate leaders such as General Ambrose Powell Hill, who was against the institution of slavery both before and during the war. Census records showed that while the General Hill's brother, father, and uncle owned slaves, General Hill did not want any himself. In addition, Hill's wife, Kitty Hill, stated that her husband never owned and would never approve of the institution of slavery. Yet in spite of General Hill's stance, the Richmond Monument was removed in December of 2020 and his body was reiterated into the Fairview Cemetery in Culpeper in January 23. Groups such as the NAACP and other left-leaning organizations have an agenda to remove all Confederate historical monuments that currently exist in public places in Amherst County and beyond. These groups don't just want Confederate monuments removed. Their agenda goes much further and deeper than that. I reside in Charlottesville in 2021, and the city removed a statue of Lewis Clark in Sacagawea. I'm nervous. I'm sorry. Um, the same year, the University of Virginia removed a monument dedicated to Thomas Jefferson's friend George Rogers Clark. But even those removals were not enough for the left leftists of Charlottesville, who had been calling for the removal of the statues of Thomas Jefferson at Charlottesville City Hall and the University of Virginia. Since 2020, too much of our Virginia history has been removed, and many other monuments remain in danger of being removed. I encourage the Albemarle. County Board of Supervisors to stand for historic preservation and to keep Amherst Confederate Monument in front of the courthouse as it has been for 101 years. Sir Philip Andrew Hamilton, GOP candidate for Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Eric. I won't make say it. <laughs> What's that? Or I'll, how do you say it? Or Rossi. Or Rossi. I was close. Okay. Eric Rossi, 244 Todd Lane. As my wife had just spoken uh, from Philip Hamilton, the last name gets a lot of people. And the reason for that is my family didn't arrive in the United States till long after the Civil War. However, history is what makes us. You know, we have to understand where we came from to understand where we're going. Um, you know, the, uh, if, it was, if it was a cloudy day all day, we wouldn't enjoy the sunshine. So without the rain, the sunshine isn't quite as nice. And I like to think of that through history. And the monument doesn't represent old things, ancient history, or as it was stated, just needed to be updated. I, I don't think that's reasonable. I mean, they started with monuments all over the country. What's next? Are we going to take the courthouse down and put up a Starbucks or maybe the battlefields? You know, we turn turn them into strip malls because it's ancient history, it's old history, it promotes what? Our history. Was slavery involved? Was it an issue? Not as much as people are making it out to be. However, they want to bring their agenda front and make people forget about the past. And I don't know if it's just because they want to relive it. I, I don't understand why we want to not learn from the past and honor those fallen soldiers. You know, when everybody rallied together, it was at the courthouse. When they were called up for service, they went to the courthouse. It's the perfect place for the monument. It remembers the men in, that died and fought in the Civil War here in this county. It's, it's the perfect place for it. It's where everybody met, and I think it should stay there. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Isaac Owen. Could state your name and district, please. 
My name is Isaac Owen, um, 6243 East Lynchburg, Salem Turnpike, Bedford, Virginia. I've been a longtime supporter of Amherst County. I used to work here, and I frequently travel and stayed here. I had ancestors in Amherst for 150 years, some serving in the War for Independence and the War Between States. The epitaph on the monument states to the memory of the sons of Amherst County, who fell from 1861 to 1865, upheld in arms the cause of Virginia in the South, who fell in battle or died from wounds, and the survivors of this war, who as long as they were lived, were ever proud that they done their part in their noble cause. To address the noble cause, the right of resistance revolution was exercised by their forefathers in 1776. The same right of resistance was exercised by Amherst citizens in 1861. In case if anyone is not aware, there were 37 pinchers of color in Amherst County, Virginia, and those records are public information. Mrs. Vanderbilt stated the epitaph as a throwback to an era of institutionalized racism promotes unequal justice. She also stated this noble cause is controversial, divisive, and a liability. You say this epitaph promotes waste and racism? Well, ma'am, I must completely disagree with you. I'm personally descended from 11 Confederate soldiers, and none of them owned slaves. Do you think they went to war to defend slavery without owning any slaves? Only 20% of all Confederate soldiers owned slaves. Yet you see the word cause and think slavery. And yet you're stating that this cause was slavery. No, ma'am. This cause was merely nothing but independence. Virginia is one of the last states to succeed, but when an army of 75,000 men was called to invade their neighbors, the response was in patriotism as their forefathers. You're asking for equality. What well, do you really think we're wearing a plaque that was put there to remember our ancestors, white and black, that put their lives on the altar of their country in a time of distress? Is equality for the ones that want to remember their sons, fathers, brothers, grandsons, cousins that went to war to protect their home, not slavery? Rewording this epitaph is nothing but another mere attempt to rewrite history and rewrite the cause of the South. I love this country and I love the people of it. And I would give the shirt off my back to anyone that needs it, regardless of color. I want to see us move forward as citizens of the county of Amherst, not rewrite history. What's next? Tearing up Union, World War I, World War II monuments because those wars were fought in times where segregated militaries were present? The truth is the Continental Army and the armies of the Confederate States of America are the only two out of these five militaries that did not have segregation. And I find removing or altering this epitaph is tyrannical, futile, and utter disrespect to the whites and blacks that fought out of Amherst County, Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Fred Loving. If you would state your name and district of residence, please. Fred Loving, 169 Lock Lane in the town of Amherst. I am the former vice chair of the Amherst County Civil War Sesquicentennial Committee that was appointed, I was appointed by the, the Board of Supervisors and served in that capacity from around 2008 to 2015. Now, I'm standing before you today looking at that county seal. And I remember when an earlier Board of Supervisors removed the Confederate battle flag from the center of that, of that county seal. Now, the, the way they went about that, they did this without any public notice, without any input from any of the groups that serve historical interests in this county. What they did, they just put it on the agenda, revision to the county seal. They didn't say what the revision was. That's all it was, revision to the county seal. And they voted on this at a meeting when it was not covered by the local newspaper. This was back when Mike Morrell was trying to cover Amherst and Nelson County. He just happened to be in Nelson <coughs> County. So why would the Board of Supervisors do this? Well, it was my position back then, and that position remains, they just want to be sneaky about it. They wanted to have it done without any fuss, uh, without any public uh, outcry or a controversy either way, they wanted to have it done so it would be completed before anybody found out about it. And it actually worked. Nobody knew anything about it and, until the next county stickers came out. Months later, I didn't notice it myself because I have a town of Amherst sticker. So 
I urged this board, do not follow the example of your predecessors. In regards to this monument, I urge you to seek out public input, seek out historical organizations, specifically the, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, Sons of Confederate Veterans, the Sons of Union Veterans, yes, there is a Sons of Union Veterans group here, as well as the Amherst Historical Society. Thank you, Mr. Lovin. Sam Patel. My name is Sam Patel. I live in District 5. I'm sorry my comments are going to be a little bit anticlimactic. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for um, considering the code changes to the MUTND ordinance. Um, we have uh, spent a lot of time with the Planning Commission and various members of the board talking through the changes and just wanted to say publicly thank you for your time and energy and your service to the county. <coughs> Sandy Esposito. Andrea Esposito, I live in District 2. I come here in, in a little different way from everybody else. I'm an architectural historian. I research both African American history and white history here in, in the county. I'm a local historian. Uh, in, in particular, some of my projects have included doing work for Scott Zion Baptist Church. Uh, I've done the Blue Ridge Tunnel. I've, I've researched both sides of both slavery and what's been going on. And history is complicated. Uh, you, you cannot fully understand it, and we cannot judge it by our current conditions and understandings. W with the Civil War itself, uh, the memorial now stands at what is the back of the courthouse. There are some people that don't even know that that exists. So this has brought up some interest in that. But the conflict, uh, this particular conflict, is, some people classify it, it was, it was simply just a struggle to defend slavery. Well, most of the men that I've been looking up from that never owned a slave. They're small farmers. Why did they fight? They fought because originally Virginia did not want to secede. But after the fall of Fort Sumter, when Lincoln called troops, they said, no, no. We're, we're neutral. You cannot bring troops through neutral land. They were going to do that. What does an army do when it's gone on the move? It's going to cause destruction. And that's why these men rose up and fought and said, well, we're succeeding. We're not, we're not going to be a part of this. Come for, forward 60 years later, when the monument was actually erected, let's see what's going on economically. The South has finally recovered from the economic dev devastation that occurred during the Civil War. We have just come off of the end of World War I. That's an, when it was erected, it was 1922. So they are looking at both of that, the veterans they have, and then they're remembering what happened before. They wanted to remember those men. That's why it was erected. There was no talk of institutional slavery or anything like that. These men fought we wanted them to be remembered. And it's much like the efforts of, at that time, these men were dying, dying off in great numbers, much like our World War II me members were in the 80s and 90s when we started doing a lot of history and remembering about them. Uh, the Bible, I, I'm gonna bring that in here. There's uh, Proverbs 23.10 and 22.28 speaks about don't remove the ancient landmarks. There's a purpose for things being put there. We need reminders. We as people need visual reminders of things that happened. Not everything is good, not everything is bad, but we need these reminders and we need things to talk about with them. We, um, I humbly ask that you keep this monument there. I, it may need, as some say, some reinterpretation to understand fully, why is it there? What's it doing? But I do want you to think about what this action has caused with the NAACP 
may lead to further destruction of our community. And that's what I'm really concerned about because I research all history. And that's it. Thank you, Ms. Esposito. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anyone else that would uh, like to address the board? Yes, sir. If you come forward, state your name and district of residence. My name is Brandon Dorsey. I live at 173 Huffman Lane in Fairfield, Virginia. I'm here today to speak on behalf of my coffee family ancestors from Amherst and Nelson counties that fought in the service of the Confederacy. None of them had slaves. They all lived up here on top of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Many of them never came home. Some of them, them left as mountain boys. Some were sent to places like South Carolina and other places where they died. Nobody even knows to this day where they're buried. They didn't have slaves and they weren't used to the swamps and it took their lives, but they, they answered the call of Virginia when the state said, come and fight. I also am here to speak on the, the memory of Daniel Winston, who is a black Confederate who served from Amherst County and died in Buena Vista, Virginia. And I just wanted y'all to see his photograph here. He was a real person. He represent, he's represented on that monument as well. I get very disturbed about the NAACP and their attacks on Confederate histories, specifically because I have a friend, a dear friend, who was a president of the NAACP chapter, one of the largest cities in this in the South in our region. He was president of the Asheville chapter, NAACP. The NAACP really was formed to end discrimination. They were successful, they won. There was no real purpose for them after that. They found themselves in a position of not having any money coming in. He was at one of these meetings in 1991 when it was decided they would go after and attack all Confederate history because they saw that as a way to raise funds. And I can guarantee you that's why they're here today, because they're here to get attention, they're here to rile up their base, and they're here to rile up their financial backers to keep their coffers full. That's all it's about for them. If they were really interested in who's to blame for slavery, they would start with blaming people in Africa who captured their neighbors and sold them to Muslim slave traders who then sold them to Portuguese slave traders who took a chance and loaded them up on a boat and dropped them off in this country. My ancestors that were on the top of that mountain came to this country as slaves. They came as contract slaves. We call it indentured servants. You had a time period that you served and you were set free. And that's the way all original black servants came to this country as well. Look up the Encyclopedia Britannica, the case of Anthony Johnson. There was a black man who owned a black indentured servant and he sued him in a Virginia state court that he had lifetime rights to the ownership of that man and he won. And from that day forward, we had chattel slavery at the hand of a black man. And there was hundreds and thousands of black slave owners in the South that owned other black uh, people. And they weren't just, I bought grandma to get out of slavery. Many of them owned sugar plantations and other things of that nature. Sir, if you could wrap up, please, uh, thank you. I do thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board? If you'd come forward, state your name and district, please. My name is Delbert Beasley. I live at 479 Beasley Road in Lynchburg. Um, I'm here to talk to you about something a little bit different, the transfer station. And my company is Waceco, and I'm interested in approaching the county to an alternative that would save you a lot of money on your disposal, your landfill, your, your um, transfer station, and would be glad to sit down and talk to you all about it. So I um, appreciate the time. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Beasley. 
Is there anyone else who would like to address the board? Hearing and seeing none, the citizen comment portion of the meeting is closed. <coughs> Moving on to section five, uh, ordinances first read. Mr. Creasy. Chairman Board, good to see you all. I'm gonna pass out. Um, so this first read um, comes after the Planning Commission held a workshop on February 2nd, 2023 to, us, to discuss code changes to Section 711 of the Amherst County Zoning and Subdivision Ordinance. Uh, Section 711 deals with our mixed-use traditional neighborhood development and then specifics to the uh, development that you approved this past summer slash fall for Mr. Sam Patel, the 180 acres uh, right behind Temple and Masson Heights ball fields. Um, the changes discussed at the workshop as well as changes made during the Planning Commission public hearing are reflected in the ordinance before you. Um, I just handed out kind of like a, uh, <coughs> a, a spreadsheet of those proposed changes. I'm not planning to go over them all specifically with you all unless you all choose for me to do so or if you have specific questions. Within the item summary, there's a recommended motion for you all. And so at this time, I'd ask if there are any questions for staff for this first read. Uh, no questions, just some comments. Um, I think the entire purpose of traditional neighborhood developments is to uh, bring back areas where people live, work, shop in the same location. Uh, I think the way the ordinance is currently drafted probably made a, uh, was better at trying to succeed with that. I understand that this is a much larger site, but I'm asking staff to go back and look at a few things. Uh, one being the individual building for floor plates. Uh, you're essentially doubling that. Um, you know, I think you're probably the reason for that is they're trying to get more towards big box retail, which I'm not sure is really appropriate for a TND. Uh, the <coughs> other one that uh, really, I would like for you to look at is this no max setback in the uh, residential districts. Um, I think that's for the multifamily dwellings. And I think the reason that they're trying to request that is so that they can get their parking in the front, which is not a traditional neighborhood development. I'm asking staff to look at those. Um, I would not be able to support the ordinance with those things in it. So that's just my comments on it. Board, any thoughts? Uh, I'll, I'll agree with you, Mr. Martin. I'd like to see them those two addressed. I think uh, with your experience uh, in the city of Pittsburgh, I think they're valid points, and uh, I would defer to you on on those items. Thank you, Mr. Ayers. No, sir. Okay. Uh, with those, uh, is there a motion to move it? forward to public hearing with those comments provided that those things are addressed yes provided they're addressed I'll make the motion that uh, we direct staff to advertise the ordinance 2023-4 for a public hearing at the June 20th meeting date motion on the floor by Mr. Pugh any discussion all right all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. I vote aye thank you Mr. Chris. thank you board all right, next thing on the agenda is the consent agenda. Board, what's your pleasure? <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the consent agenda as, as presented. Thank you, Mr. Ayers. Motion on the floor by Mr. Ayers. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I vote aye. Now we will move on to a special presentation by second stage, the annual report. Welcome. My name is Sonny Monk, and I'm here as president of the board of Second Stage, and this is my friend and colleague, Jessie Scheip, who has almost completed her first year as director of Second Stage. You know I don't miss a moment to speak, so I'm gonna say one little thing, but she's here to um, give you an update on our annual report. Um, 
I know Mr. Ayers knows this, and probably Mr. Bryant, but this is the 11th, excuse me, and Mr. Pugh. This is the 11th year of addressing the Board of Supervisors on behalf of Second Stage. And across those years, we have developed the most satisfying relationship of trust and partnership. And I wanted to thank you all for that. Um, I wanted to particularly thank you. Um, Dean Rogers was an early supporter of ours, and we always felt that he was a friend and an advisor. David Prophet, as he moves on to uh, other activities, has been a good friend and has kept us grounded. And we want to thank David especially. But mostly, thank you for this, uh, Mr. Bryant. He has been sort of in the background, but a good friend and an advisor and knowledgeable about Second Stage. So even before he was named, uh, he came to visit us to renew and review, and thank you. Jesse Scheip has come to us from a, a wide variety of other professional activities, and if you look at our website uh, or even see the signs around town, you'll know that she's just wearing me out. She's just ramped up all the activities. We're open again for business. It's such fun, and I asked her to tell you about that. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, again, I'm Jessie Scheip, and I am the director of Second Stage. Thank you for having us here. Um, we are excited to be able to engage the community and offer different activities for residents of Amherst County. Not only am I looking to enhance that nonprofit, but I'm also looking at building partnerships um, and supporting the county in various ways. We have lots of events, so please check out our website, but I also want to send each of you a personal invitation to a live radio broadcast um, that's happening on Saturday at Second Stage. Go online, get your tickets, and I hope to see you there. Thank you. Questions? Any questions for us? Second Stage. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We appreciate what you do. Okay, next thing on the agenda is old business uh, transfer <coughs> station options. Is this you, Mr. Bryant? I'm going to start this off. Yes, thank you. Okay, we are joined today um, by Ryan Mann from SES. I've asked Ryan and both Stacy McBride to join us to answer questions. Uh, Mr. Thacker is going to provide you a presentation in just a moment. Um, what I wanted to point out is that the May 2nd Board of Supervisors meeting, you gave us direction to proceed with opening landfill cell 2. Uh, we will do that. You also ask us to go back and look at a few different options. So. In general terms, we're bringing back three options. One, um, the transfer station. There is a, a, a spreadsheet that's in your packet that lays out, uh, I think very succinctly, the cost of the transfer st first station annually, uh, the cost of the convenience center option annually, and the cost of mothballing it also annually. So in general terms, if you look at the annual cost to keep, to keep the transfer station open with, with both uh, the requested salaries for two additional persons, um, and the equipment is 140,000. Uh, the convenience center option is 70,000. Plus, you have to add in a one-time transfer station closure cost if we go to the convenience station option. And then the third scenario, we call it the mothballing scenario, which is closing the convenience centers. I mean, the transfer station, um, and and keeping enough staff available to provide some type of facility dumpster. Um, or and or keeping a road open to the landfill where, where we're putting basically folks back on that. Um, what we've prepared for you is a presentation that provides both pros and cons of those three scenarios. Um, what, what we did additionally as staff is we, um, we looked back at our fee schedules and one thing that we learned is that the fee schedule f hasn't been updated since 2000. So it's been 23 years since we've reevaluated our fee schedule and, and I think from a staff perspective, we learned a lot. Uh, we're excited to share with you um, some of the things that we learned, and we have a recommendation in our package uh, for you. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Thacker. He's going to run through this presentation with these pros and cons and, and different co cost options. And again, if you have any questions for Ron Mann from SES, who is here, and Ms. McBride, who did some uh, research in terms of the bond uh, requirements. Mr. Thacker. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Greetings, board. 
So at the last meeting in May or the first meeting in May, you asked us to bring back three options as Mr. Bryant indicated. I want to go through those with you and the scenarios. So the scenario one is continuing to operate solely as a transfer station. So pros is that the county's investment of $2.6 million is being <coughs> fully utilized. The citizens are pleased. The feedback we hear is the ease of use and the paved ingress and egress. If you went to the landfill prior to the transfer station being there, you're always on gravel, especially after a rain that would turn very muddy and unpleasant. And then the two full-time dedicated staff allows for our interchangeability between the landfill and other public works operations, and it keeps us compliant with the DEQ permit we have in hand. The con of this is slightly more costly to operate than the proposed convenience center. It's not truly used as a dedicated transfer station, as Mr. Martin has said previously. It's not really a convenience center. It's not really a transfer station. We are transferring it, but we're transferring it approximately a quarter mile to the landfill. And finally, the building and adjoining road set atop a permitted future cell three of the landfill. The landfill has four cells. We're currently concluding cell one. Uh, you've authorized us to open cell two when the time's appropriate. The transfer station sits on cell three and there's also a cell four. So as a staff, including Mr. Bryant, Ms. McBride, and Mr. Profit, we've gotten together and talked about ways uh, to fund the personnel needed to keep it as a transfer station. So we looked at our internal costs and we also looked at external costs. Uh, the only other landfill adjacent to us is Region 2000, which Nelson, Bedford City, uh, sorry, just Nelson, Bedford City, and Bedford County transfer their trash out. Uh, Blue Ridge has their own landfill, then Appomattox uses Region 2000. If you look at the standard rates, we're not the lowest and we're certainly not the highest. Uh, if you look particularly at the residential hauling rate, it's zero dollars, meaning any commercial hauler and come into our landfill if they're picking up residential trash in Amherst and they're not charged a fee. So they forego any fees for Amherst County. So uh, the rates, as Mr. Bryant said, have not changed since the year 2000. You as a board can adjust the rates at any time you see fit and those rates can take effect according to our code after 60 days. So in the transfer station scenario, we would need two personnel back at the landfill to restore the two that were brought to the transfer station in August of last year when it opened. So we've come up with several scenarios we'd like to present to you today. Again, we talked about the zero dollar fee we were charging residential uh, commercial carriers. If we were to restore that, it would be 6,839 tons were used last year. It would be 379, almost $380,000 of revenue recurring that could be poured back into the county. We also offer a commercial discount. Right now it's $44. Uh, if we were to eliminate that and move it up to what is a $55.50 per tonnage rate, that is a lower rate than the average, which is $55.63. That would include $149,500 of recurring revenue. You could also raise the commercial tipping rate. Right now we do offer a discount to commercial carriers at $44. If we moved it up to say $50 a ton, that would be $78,000 of recurring revenue. And finally, increasing the standard rate, as I mentioned earlier, right now we charge $53 at the gate. If we move that to $55.50 on average, which is still below the average, that would be $32,500 of recurring revenue. These are a lot of numbers I'm throwing at you. Feel free to stop at any time or continue to go. Yeah, well, just to... When you look up, right now we have a, a free for the commercial haulers. They pick residential trash up, they bring it to the landfill, and they're not charged a rate, right? That's free. So if we do charge a rate, I would assume they're going to pass that cost on to everyone that gets their trash picked up. So that's we may receive more money out of that, but everyone that's paying a trash bill in the county will see probably a substantial increase in their trash bill. Well, that is a possibility, and I was asked to look this up. So uh, there is a firm that charges, uh, they service Amherst County and adjacent counties, Campbell County and other counties. Right now there's a $23 per charge month for two containers, and that's in the Timberlake area. And then in Amherst we called, and it was $16.50 a month. So the rates vary. So the discount that they're receiving for, day, for not being charged tonnage is really not, does not appear to be passed on to the customers at this time. But Mr. Pugh, you do make a relevant point and that a waste hauler can easily say, hey, you're raising the rate on me, I'm gonna to have to pass it on to our customers. That's a fair argument. 
What I would say to you is today we have four different haulers servicing Amherst County, including Mr. Beasley, who I spoke with this morning. He is willing to come into the county to serve it as well. So that's when the fair market, free market principles come into relevancy. To say, fine, if you're going to raise my rate, I'll go to these other three customers, these other three vendors, and see how they fare. So it would be a temporary price spike we anticipate, but we also have six convenience centers that the customers can take it to at any time. They don't charge anything, as well as the landfill. May I go on? Any other questions, sir? Yes, please continue. Thank you. A scenario two, which was discussed, was converted into a modified convenience center. So the pros, it is less expensive than operated in the permitted transfer station. The citizens can continue to utilize it, that is the paved road. It would be a different layout. We would have to make modifications to the current transfer station. And passenger cars and trucks still avoid the dangerous landfill face in the surrounding areas. Some of the cons include foregoing the DEQ permit that took two years to acquire, unsure of what the cost would be or the conditions to reestablish at a later date. While you did authorize the landfill to open cell two, at some point that is going to conclude. So either we have to open up another cell at the landfill or revert back to a transfer station in say 13 to 15 years. Don't know what the cost or conditions would be at that time. I talked about re refitting the new building to accommodate citizen only traffic flow right now. The transfer station has about a 55 foot hole at the end of it to dump into a trailer that trucks can back up and dump it off. We would alter it so citizens couldn't fall in the trailer per se. It would still require one full-time landfill employee to spend at least half a day at the site. So if we operate as a convenience center, think of our other convenience centers throughout the county, uh, these men and women who operate those are not permitted to drive heavy-duty equipment. Even as a convenience center, we still have the tractor and trailer set up. We would need a landfill employee who's full-time and who's qualified to drive it to take it to the landfill. We anticipate that, be, anticipate that being almost four hours a day doing that. And no commercial traffic would be allowed at the site. So if you look at the pretty pictures at the bottom of the slide, those are some of the trucks that can come now. You have a front end loader, side loader, roll off, rear end loader, dump truck, dump trailers. If it's a commercial, it cannot go in that anymore as a convenience center. Scenario three is closing the transfer station facility entirely. So it is absolutely the least expensive of all options. It does allow for a potential return of the site to a cell three landfilling space at a later date and it is the most operationally efficient. However, it is highly dangerous. Uh, if you'll see that graph in the middle, those are worker fatalities in the waste industry. So last year there were 46, the majority of those being on landfill faces. So imagine a 100,000 pound piece of equipment backing up to our Ford Taurus because they can't see it. It happens all the time. And we'd have to revert to using the roll-off containers that we used prior to opening the transfer station. It's really inefficient and it's filthy, which will be on the next slide. And it essentially wastes the $2.6 million county investment that the county has poured into this facility for the past five years. So just as a visual, these are 20 yard containers to the left on the slide. It would take about 16 of those getting filled up to equal one 53 foot trailer that we have now. So imagine, again, a part-time landfill employee or a full-time landfill employee spending part of their time at the transfer station dumping that can 16 different times as opposed to having the trailer. And that concludes my presentation. If you all have any questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, board. Yeah, I have a few. Um, regarding your matrix, matrix it says uh, in the beginning, it says how, it costs $5,000 for building site maintenance when uh, the transfer station is operating. And as a convenience center, uh, as a convenience center, excuse me, but $25,000 when it is not being used at all. So there's a $5,000 a year price when it's being used. And if it gets mothballed, there's a $25,000 price. First page of your matrix. Are you referring to the other slideshow? Yes. yes. Okay. That one, which is going to be the other question for you. Yeah, I can answer that if you want me to, Brian. Please. Okay, so the 5,000 building and site maintenance um, is related specifically to the building of the transfer station. In the mothball option, you now have to update the roads around the landfill um, because you have traffic going directly to, excuse me, <coughs> you have traffic going directly to the landfill site. Um, okay. 
okay. I mean, that explains it. Um, yeah, so that the transfer station and convenience center option uh, maintenance only includes road and building at the transfer station because landfill traffic will be solely for the landfill. In the mothball option, you now have to accommodate for residential traffic going to the landfill. Okay. I have several questions. Another one is, um, it's been stated before that about every seven years we need to refurbish the floor of the transfer center at a cost of about $250,000 a year. Uh, that would be roughly $35,000 a year if you prorate it. Is this included anywhere in your calculations, or is this just a price? It is. Yes, sir. All right. Specifically, it's just in the total amount to operate it? Yes, sir. So under the transfer station scenario, it'd have to be retrofitted more frequently, say seven years, because you have commercial traffic on it, whereas in the convenience center option, that may be extended out to 10 years, 10, 12 years. But the, all the costs are figured in. All right, and then just exactly what does it mean to operate the uh, transfer station as a convenience center? Will there be compactors, bins for metal, plastics, et cetera? You know, it's just kind of hard to determine exactly what that would entail. So it'll look the way it does now, except there won't be commercial traffic there. So cars and trucks, residential traffic will still go in there, but you won't have any kind of commercial vehicles. So it's an 8,000 square foot facility that's designed for commercial traffic with three bays. It'd be down to maybe a quarter of the usage it currently gets now. But you'd have cars theoretically circle in and circle back out, much like a convenience center, but it would not be compactors in different containers. It'd still be the same setup as you see today. So, in essence, in order to, uh, the transfer station, in order to operate for commercial vehicles, it has to maintain as a transfer station. You can't, you can't operate it as a convenience center and steal back the commercial traffic in there, dump it like this happening right now. If you have a permit, you can do commercial traffic. If you remove the permit, you cannot. So if you operate it as a convenience center only, there would be no commercial traffic. All right, if you've got another question, go ahead. I'm just looking. Well, <clears throat> so I went out and visited the site, and thank you for your time driving me around. I, th I think that what was eye-opening to me was kind of the, the road leading to the field slopes where you're working and how dangerous that would be to have citizens going up there. Um, kind of opened my eyes. My, my question are is kind of on the scenario. So it looks like to me, uh, if, if you went with the transfer station option, the annual cost is about 140,000. So that's two staff people, equipment maintenance, building site maintenance, and utilities. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So if we go back to your PowerPoint, all right, and you look at all those different scenarios, uh, on ways to fund it, which thank you for doing that. Um, remove free commercial residential tipping that would bring in an additional 379,000, which is more than double what you need, correct? Yes, sir. So you could put a small fee on it and come up with it, or if you just did the eliminate commercial discount, that would fund it or you could do a combination of things, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So I, I think you addressed this. Um, so you're saying we, commercial haulers for residential uh, trash in Amherst are charging about $16 for two cans? Well, that was one to two phone calls. So say in the town of Amherst, it's a different rate than it would be outside of the town. All right. So... I, I kind of I appreciate where you're going with this, and I think it's more palatable than what it was last time, but I think I would like more research on, you know, how much other uh, residents of other localities are paying for trash, you know, pick up, because we know that the commercial haulers of residential trash in other localities are paying these fees, right? To those individual facilities like Region 2000, yes. Right. right. So when they go there, they're paying a fee, but when they come to Amherst, they're not paying anything. Correct. So one way to look at that is, okay, the 
county's doing that to keep costs down for residential customers, which we need data to make sure that that's factual, right? Or the commercial haulers are making a lot of money off the county. I don't know which one until we see the data, correct? Yes. Okay, so I would like to see that data. I would like to see um, maybe a, whatever that comes out to, I would like to see a, you know, maybe a combination of things instead of putting it all on the commercial residential tipping or all, on, or all just on eliminating the commercial discount. And my, my other point is, I don't think this is a decision that we could, but I don't think just us three board members should make it. So I, I would like to see that information at our next meeting, unless you want to move forward, which we can, but I would propose we table this to the next meeting and give you a chance to bring that information back. I'd be happy to. I will state that calling private haulers and asking for rates throughout areas is a little bit sensitive, so they're not obliged to answer my request, but I will certainly do I, so. I understand. Just ask you to do the best that you can. Yes, sir. And Mr. Uh, Beasley. Beasley came in with something. Maybe talk to him, but we appreciate what you're doing. So I motion that we table this until our next meeting. Mr. Chairman. Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Harris. I want to reiterate what you brought up about Mr. Beasley. I think that gentleman has been in the trash business in every way, shape, or form pretty much his entire life. <clears throat> uh, and I, actually, I think it came to him through his father, so probably all of his life. Um, and uh, Mr. Bryan, I would ask, as long as the other two board members present here today, if, if you would set up a meeting with him and, and see what program he's got in mind that may help. We spent a lot of money in this land, in this landfill over the last few years. and. If this gentleman has some options that may uh, help the citizens of this county with the cost of, uh, of trash management, uh, I think our ears should be open to him as well. So if you could work out some type of arrangement to sit down with him, and if he wants to put a program together to present to us as some, some options that he may have that would save um, our citizens uh, some money, we definitely should be open to that. Absolutely. And, and the other thing we, we could do as far as calling the trash services and ask them what their prices are. If we know individuals or residents that live in the other localities, you can get that information as well. I can tell you what someone in Madison Heights pays, for example, I know, or maybe we know someone on Timberlake and other areas we can call that actually has a bill. And, and because you never know what type of information you'll get from the company, they don't have to give you any of that information. But there's ways you can get it. You could call and ask as a citizen and get it. Sure. Uh, okay, so no more no more discussion. There's a motion to table this by myself until the next meeting. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. I vote aye. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Moving on to the Bolton 457B plan analysis report. This sounds exciting. <laughs> Several months ago, um, you all gave county staff some money out of your professional services line to hire Bolton Consulting to evaluate our 457B plan, which is the deferred comp plan that our Plan 1 and Plan 2 VRS employees participate in. Um, I've asked Mike Bezkowski, I'm make sure I pronounce it correctly, um, who is the consultant who, who did the evaluation to present his um, the data that he found and um, answer any questions the board might have. So I'll turn the time over to Mike. Welcome. Is this any better? Okay. Sounds like that works then. Now, again, it's an honor and pleasure to um, speak with you today. I'm Mike Bezkowski with Bolton. I serve as an independent consultant on retirement plans, particularly in the government sector. And I'm not of my firm. I just celebrated my 27th year anniversary. Um, we're not what I like about our firm the most. It's not affiliated with any money manager. It's not affiliated with any vendor. We strict we work strictly on your behalf on getting good retirement plans together. I think I was at a conference a few years ago and somebody referred to us as the 
Ralph Nader of the investment consulting industry. So my goal is, uh, the part I love about my job as well is saving fees for my clients so that their employees will have more money for retirement. So we were hired to conduct a review of your current deferred compensation plan with Nationwide. And our, um, I'm gonna just uh, touch on a couple pages of what we found, what we think next steps will be, and um, answer any questions you may have. Uh, so our goal review was all encompassing. We took a look at the fees in the program, we took a look at the investment option, and we took a look at the type of contract that you're using relative to what's available in the marketplace right now. And in essence, um, and, you, and don't worry, you're not alone, uh, but you're using one of an older, um, more restrictive contract with Nationwide. In my opinion, it has higher fees and um, uh, I would say the best, um, I would say slightly inferior investment options at this point relative to what's available in the marketplace. To call your attention to a couple of the um, slides in my presentation on page seven, just some, um, a few highlights of what we found out. Number one, there were too many investment options in the plan. There were over 30 investment options. The optimal number is about 15 to 17. And too many investment options actually causes participants not to participate. It just simply becomes too confusing. So that's one of our observations regarding the fund lineup. There's dupl uh, in that, there's duplication in the investment lineup with the investment categories. So you may have, for example, three large cap value funds or six international options. Again, all that creates a barrier to participation. Um, we also know that the expense ratios on the investment options are relatively high and that the performance of the investment options is poor compared to some of the peers that are out there right now. Um, on uh, page 10 and page 11 of my report, are just uh, peer rankings of some of the funds in your plan relative to others that are available. There's a lot of colors in this. Uh, the way to read this is if when we're comparing funds relative to their peers, other similar managed funds, um, the, the chart shows those that are in the top quartile are green, light green is second quartile, orange is third quartile, and red is fourth quartile. Um, so you'd rather be in the first percentile than in in the dark green than in the orange or the red. What you notice in the report though, are there are a lot of funds in the red and in the orange. Um, so there are better individual funds that are out there for participants. Um, on page uh, 13, or actually page 12 rather, in addition to the investment options, we also took a look at the fee structure. And participants pay two particular fee, uh, fees in these retirement plans. They pay an administrative fee to the vendor to administer their account. And second, they pay investment management fees, the individual expense ratios of each of the funds. Right now, in these older contracts, they're bundled together in an arrangement called revenue sharing, which is not one of the ideal scenarios on how to price retirement plans. Part of the reason is the fees participants are paying are non-transparent. They can't see them on their statements. So what happens if, if, if you're being charged 1% and you're making 8%, you're seeing 7% credited to your account, but you don't see that 1% being actually taken out. So most individuals think their retirement plan is free or they're not paying anything, and that's, of course, not true. So um, when we took a look at the fees that you're relatively paying, they are um, on page 13. They're being paid through this revenue sharing arrangement, and I like to, I've like i heard the term called the Wall Street kickback um, because they're actually, um, the funds are paying companies um, to put their funds on their platform. Your fees are also generally higher in the marketplace than what we find available right now. So again, being a more um, restrictive contract, uh, many times uh, it's the plan sponsor's responsibility under Virginia State Code to actually proactively benchmark the fees and make sure they're reasonable to the marketplace. So our analysis showing the fees that you currently have are, are generally more expensive. Um, and then you also have, I would just say from an investment standpoint, you have a very large amount of the money which is invested in the fixed account, about 40%. It really becomes difficult for participants to save over a lifetime in, with their money and sitting in cash. So um, on page 16, I just wanted to show you, uh, give you an idea what participants are currently paying. Um, they're currently paying between 70 and 95 basis points for, um, administrative fees 
depending upon which investment option your, your uh, a participant selects, and they're also paying revenue sharing. So it's a very, very expensive program right now. Um, we actually compared the fees nationwide charging on to the marketplace, and we went back to nationwide and asked, if you could provide us a better contract, what would your fee be? So they came back and actually they reduced it to 35 basis points or 0.35%, which is more in line with what the marketplace offers right now and much more competitive than what your participants are paying right now. Lastly, um, another place where we should be able to reduce fees is on the investment expense ratios right now. We generally found those to be um, uh, high. And for example, the cost of your S&P 500 index option is about 44 basis points. There are substitutes out there that are just at 1.5. So every basis point or every little bit of savings that we can make in this, we can actually reduce fees, um, which means more money in your participant's account. I should also preface, preface that um, the question has come up, can we get out of the nationwide contract? And the answer to that right now is it's very expensive to do so. There are, the way the nationwide contract is written is that there's our, uh, and we're, because of the interest rate movement, it becomes very difficult to liquidate this type of contract in the interest rate environment that we're in right now. So the thought was potentially to rebid this, but given that it's difficult to exit, our thought was to transition to nationwide's less expensive contract, and when the interest rates stabilize and become more favorable, or there's other options available um, that we can take advantage of, then that would be the time to actually conduct an RFP to see what else is out there. Um, so. Uh, our next thought would be in the nationwide open architecture platform, we're able to refresh the investment lineup. So we're able to get a, a ton of, um, I guess, a list of top performing managers, um, move to more fee transparent structure, and then, um, um, and then communicate that to participants. That will result in some significant savings. Um, was there additional? I, have, I guess that was really the conclusion of our report in our committee meeting um, was with regard to uh, what we found out that is an older contract, there are better contracts available. Um, we want to implement the newer contract with Nationwide. And then um, a part of our charge would be actually um, refreshing the investment lineup and looking that for the, the next fiscal year. I'll stop to see if there are any questions or comments. Bottom line to me, what does this do for our employees? Bottom line, it will, get, it will um, save your participants more money for retirement. Somebody talk to them about that and explain this to them. Which, you don't need to answer that right yet because I think what you're proposing in the next agenda item is to continue working with you, right, before we do anything, right? We're not proposing to change anything right now, are we? Going to Nationwide's less less expensive contract. Um, we after we saw the report, we asked Mike to start working on that immediately, um, so that we can save the employees money in their fees. And then what I would do in this next year is work with Mike to realign the investment um, portfolio, um, educate the employees about their investments and how to better um, get a better return on their investments and also um, to guide me through the Secure 2.0 um, regulation changes because it is very complex. There are up to 93 possible changes that could impact our plan, <clears throat> and I do need assistance with that. I'm, I'll, I'll be very straight and forward. My primary concern is that whatever we do is not hindering but benefiting our employees. And I don't know enough about this to tell you what's good or bad, so I'm going to have to go off on staff recommendations. Unless you all know, I have no idea. Mr. Popovich, do you know? No. Okay. Do you? Well, I can, I can, yes, I can tell you that I um, sat on the committee panel meeting um, and learned a lot about um, some of these fees and some of the things that I was con also very concerned about in terms of the contract that we're in now. Um, I do recommend that we make these changes. Um, that's why Ms. Warner said, or Felix, I'm sorry, uh, to make these recommendations quickly because the, our, there are a lot of hidden fees and this is a much older 
um, contract that we're working under. Um, and so that's why staff's moving quickly on this. Okay. Uh, I have a couple questions or, or just comments. Um, nationwide, do they have any support? You know, they're the ones that are offering this 457B, is that correct? Correct. So that they don't have any type of support that the people that are using it can call and talk to about the potential investments? Yes, we have, we have a representative from their company who regularly talks to our employees, but a, a nationwide representative is not gonna disclose the hidden fees to our employees. That's what we, we hired Mike to find out. I know there are a lot of laws and stipulations of, of, of reporting the fees and certain things that need to be done, you know, as far as what companies are required to do. Uh, I mean, I assume they were following all of those legal requirements. Well, the, the rules that apply to corporate plans are different than they that apply to governmental plans. So the so-called fee disclosure that was came out, rules that came out in 2012, 2013, really were not applicable to non-ERISA 457B plans such as this. So in my, my opinion, and uh, this is part of the reason why individuals in governmental plans typically pay more than the corporate plans, number one, because uh, fee disclosure such as this does not apply to them. And as far as the products available or the investments available, they're normally chosen by Nationwide. They'll give you a list of how much allocations you want to put in individual, whether it's a fund investment, what have you. Is that correct? Are you trying to limit the number of investments that, that to make it more simple, did I hear that? That's correct, so we wanna, number one, reduce the investment lineup and also refresh it. So nationwide, interestingly, although they administer the plan, they are not a fiduciary to the county or the plan. So if you, when we take a look at the lineup, one of, the, um, one of what we found out was that there are a lot of nationwide's own proprietary funds in the lineup. So nationwide, in, in my opinion, it's a conflict of interest. Um, they're serving as the record keeper and they're also, um, there's also additional revenue being derived from the nationwide funds themselves. So through a refresh process and in implementing the new contract, we're able to select the investment options and nationwide's agnostic to it. Um, we tell them, um, uh, the county would tell nationwide, these are the investment options we wanna use. That's what would be av made available to participants. So as the fiduciary, we would be providing advice to the county and staff on what investment options should be offered to participants. What I heard from you is that you actually need some some help in navigating some of I, I, whatever it was. I don't even remember what you said, but yes, you, need, you need some some organizational help on navigating through this, sir. Yes, sir. I am not a, an expert on this matter. Um, my role is to roll the benefits out to the employees and to explain them to the best of my ability. But with this new federal regulation that became in effect January 1st, it, the changes that need to happen are very complex. And I wanna make sure that the choices we make benefit our employees in the best way. And that's why I need Mike's help. Okay. okay. Right, so, for example, if I may, for example, one of the options in the Secure 2.0 is a student loan repayment. <laughs> Um, <coughs> excuse me. So there are, in my opinion, many of the options are not just retirement plan, they're financial wellness. So the county will have to decide whether it actually wants to add this option to the retirement plan or, or not. There's no requirement right now, but, um, but certainly it's worth merits consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next thing on our agenda is the continuation of the Bolton Consulting Services. Yes, and what I'm asking is to take funds that are already in my budget uh, remaining this year and funds from next year that will not be needed because of um, choices that were made um, during the budget process and um, use those to, to pay for Mike's services um, so that he can advise me over the next year. Okay. Pleasure. Considering that, that, you know, we're being asked by the HR director and it will help our employees and uh, hopefully this will mean more money in our employees' pockets, you know, less fees, I'll go ahead and make the motion that the board directs staff to execute the new contract with Nationwide Retirement Solutions negotiated by Bolton Consultants and authorize staff to use $13,500 in surplus HR funds to contract with Bolton Consultants consultants to provide continued evaluation and oversight of the county's 
457B plan through June 30th, 2024. Motion on the floor by Mr. Pugh. Board, is there any other discussion? If not, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I vote aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next thing on the agenda is potential code change postponement of public hearings. Mr. Bryant. I'll, I'll tackle it, Mr. Pop Popovich. If I say anything wrong, jump in and sure. correct me, please. Um, this is fairly straightforward and simple. Th this request um, states that if you're if an applicant through the zoning process is applying for either a special exception, rezoning, some type of form of public hearing, um, that that after the public hearing has been advertised, the applicant may only withdraw the application and shall remain responsible for the cost of the advertisement. Um, therefore, you know, the applicant cannot, for example, the applicant cannot ask after it's been through the Planning Commission for it to go back to the Planning Commission. The only action that they are, are allowed to do is to request a withdrawal and not, not to send it back to a Planning Commission. Um, this clarifies things for us. Um, this is fairly straightforward. Um, and we will certainly verify that the advertising costs have been paid. So I'll speak to this since I requested it. Uh, I believe at the last meeting we had a uh, pretty large petition in front of us, and uh, originally uh, they had requested to postpone, and I think they requested to postpone because they had gotten um, the idea that their petition probably wasn't going to pass. And, you know, as I mentioned at the last meeting, they had been working on this since 2019. And then to get to the last minute, we have numerous citizens show up to a public hearing uh, and just to be able to request to postpone it, that doesn't quite sit right with me. So I think if they go through the process and we advertise it, um, it should be up to the board to postpone it. Um, and it shouldn't be automatic. So. Uh, I'll make the motion to direct staff to prepare an ordinance that will uh, be sent to Planning Commission for a public hearing. Uh, is there any discussion on that? Mr. Ayers? Motion. All right. Motion on the floor by myself. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. I vote aye. Next item on the agenda is the County Administrator's Report. Mr. Bryant. Yes, sir. Um, I do have one amendment to the project status report that's in your package. Um, the Old Town Madison Heights item, which is the first item, uh, we did hold a uh, management team meeting on Monday um, with Mr. Wade, who participated in that, that meeting. Um, what we learned was there is a, what's called a scattered site grant um, program, and we're looking still in that Old Town area. This scattered site grant program allows you to go a, approximately a five-mile area. Um, so the management team directed the Central Virginia Planning District Commission um, to, to start moving forward on a planning grant. Um, and so that would start to frame the, the ability for us to potentially go out for a full grant later. Um, so I just wanted to give you that update that we are working towards moving towards a planning grant for future uh, developments. Uh, and, and generally these community development block grants are housing related. Um, they're mostly, they're housing heavy. Um, and so that's what we would be looking at as a housing grant in that area. So that's an update on that. Any questions on the project status report? I won't go over anything else unless you have a specific question. Okay, next okay. item is the change, no, revisions to the HR regulations. Ms. Felix, oh, there you go. <laughs> As permitted by HR regulation section 1.14, the county administrator is recommending revisions to the HR regulation related to the FY 2024 COLA. We always move the um, wage structure for the county by the COLA to keep us current with the market so that our starting pay does not end up being less than what we can hire people at. Um, this, uh, the changes also have to do with the change to the 40-hour work week that becomes effective July 1. We have to update all those leave charts so that um, it talks about eight-hour employees instead of, um, we, like we delete the seven-and-a-half-hour employee column, for instance. And then uh, we needed new policy language um, to clarify uh, the, our current policy regarding leave payouts. 
Um, we have had a couple of employees who wanted to object to us doing it the way the IRS has told us to do it, and so we just felt like we needed some language and policy that we could point to, to um, when that happens. And then fin finally, I made some minor policy changes to be congruent with uh, county practice since I was sort of doing an overhaul of the entire plan. Um, typically, uh, you all just accept the county administ administrator's recommendation, or if you have a concern with any policy, you can pull that out separately um, for discussion. And I'm here to answer any questions you have about the changes too. So tell me about the payout for sick leave. Okay. So do we pay out all sick leave or just- We, we pay out um, annual leave and compensatory time. We're required to do that by law. Um, and uh, in, with employees who are required to work on holidays, um, we, we could treat that holiday time like comp time. So, um, so, so annual leave and comp time is what we pay out. We have a sick leave payout that is a dollar amount and that has limits and ha has to do with longevity. Um, and so that's, I think, 1500 and 2500 1500 for employees who are with the county 10 years and 2,500 for so max. Yes, yeah, so that's limited. Um, we've had a couple of large um, lead payouts where the employees wanted us to tax the payout differently than the IRS tells us to tax it. So this language is just clarifying how we handle those payouts. Okay, board, any questions for Ms. Felix? All right, um, so you need a motion. Okay. So well, actually, I think you can just accept it. I don't think we need a motion at all. Well, I think that's the motion. I move okay. the board accept the revisions <laughs> to the HR regulation recommended by the county administrator, which will become effective July 1st, 2023. Board, any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I vote aye. Thank you, Ms. Felix. Next thing is the county attorney's report, legal services. Well, I've, I have, oh, no, no, uh, no, we got, we got an important one. You oh, know. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Change to the meeting schedule, July 4th. Does anybody want to come in on July the 4th? May I? You want to come in? No, I just I would like to make one comment. I have one comment to make. Okay. Um, so staff is recommending that we 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 cancel that meeting, Mr. Pugh. So I think you were heading that direction. But uh, we do recommend that we cancel that meeting, uh, with the caveat, um, Mrs. Hansen has a request that could be pending with the EDA, where that could be time sensitive based on their multi-tenant building and some bids that have come in and the sensitivity of timing of that. Uh, there's a lot at play right now. We're also looking at um, some funding options that we may need to come back. So staff may reach out to you for a potential called meeting if we can't seem to fit. Oh, that's fine. But, but I don't think anybody's coming. But on. for July 4th, we're recommending that we absolutely cancel that meeting. Okay. You need to just follow whatever the protocol is for a called meeting. Right. Mr. Pugh, you are well on your way. All right. Well, I'll move that the board cancel the July 4th, 2023 meeting. On this? Oh. All right. Motion on the floor by Mr. Pugh. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you so much. Yes, Mr. Brown. Okay. Well, I have an announcement. Um, Mrs. McBride is here to announce two new members of our team oh, that we would great. like to introduce to you. Sorry we didn't have it on the agenda, but we wanted to make sure that we took this time to introduce them to you. Cool. <laughs> So um, with Mr. Prophet's retirement, we have restructured. And our first hire is Ms. Melissa Woodard. She comes to us from the State Department of Health, the Lynchburg District. She'll be our procurement and contract manager. So um, she's been here a month. <laughs> so um, stop by and see her. She's currently residing with Mark until David parts, but we're, <laughs> we're getting there. And then just this last week, um, this is Dericia Belford. She's our county division manager. We decided to restructure a little bit so that um, it frees up hopefully some of my time. And she comes from us by way of Lynchburg City Schools with a short stop in Danville Public Schools before she came here. <laughs> nice. Well, welcome to Amherst. We appreciate you. So we're just feeding her the fire hose now, feeding both of them the fire hose right now. 
That's what we tend to do. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you so much. Yeah. Congratulations. Have fun with what you do, okay? Now may I move on to Mr. You may. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> County Attorney Report. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, with the departure of Mr. Lockerbie from our firm uh, and the decision uh, by the Board of Supervisors to retain our firm's services for purposes of providing legal services for the County Board of Supervisors and for uh, the service authority uh, and to allow Mr. Lockerbie to provide legal services to the Economic Development Authority, uh, there's need for approval of two retention letters, one from our firm and one from um, the Spillman Law Firm that Mr. Lockerbie went to. All right. Board, any discussion? Is there a motion? All right. You ready for a motion? Yes, sir. I move to authorize the county administrator to execute the retention letters for legal services from the firm of Goyan, Waddell, PC, and Spillman, Thomas, and Battle. Motion on the floor by Mr. Pugh. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I vote aye. Congratulations. Please execute a contract. All right. Our retention letters. Mr. Pugh, tell us all about the Planning Commission. All right. Well, we continue to uh, do a lot of work. We've had a lot of uh, exceptions come through the last few months. We had two special exceptions that were re recommended for approval. One was uh, the Dillard Mansion, which they want to do an Airbnb and a special events and weddings and so forth. That, that was passed. And a kennel for breeding at 245 Old Farm Road, that also passed. Um, You've seen some of these today. The, uh, well, there was one you brought up. There's 2023-7, the revoking a special exception, 2020-380 was recommended for approval. That's uh, on 29 North towards Clifford. Although the applicant has made substantial progress, I see that paving has went on, trees have been planted. So uh, it certainly does look a lot better than it did. So I'll give them uh, credit where that is deserved, certainly. Um, also, we've already had it before us today, but it was Ordinance 2023-4, which is in, increases density and changes to lot size requirements and development standards with, within the MU TND. That was a recommended for approval. We saw that earlier today. We moved that forward. Uh, we're also going to eventually hold a workshop on these utility scale solar facilities. Uh, we haven't scheduled that yet, but we're going to look into that and see what we want to do going forward as far as these large facilities that have uh, been inquired from Amherst County. So we're going to see what we want to do with that and talk that out and hopefully come up with a solution or a guidance to what we want to see done in the county. So that was all. Thank you, Mr. Pugh. All right, we are back to citizen comment. Is there anyone present that would like to address the board? Hearing and seeing none, uh, citizen comment is closed. Matters from the members of the board. Mr. Pugh? No, sir. Mr. Ayers? No, sir. Guess what? Today at 6 p.m., our own Amherst County Lancer baseball team plays in the quarterfinals for the state championship. Uh, I've had the pleasure to go to almost every game away and home, and uh, these Young men and coaches have worked extremely hard, so please go and try and support them. But if you really want to see a good softball <coughs> game, on June 25th, the Sheriff's Office, Manelson Fire Department, Amherst Fire Department, and maybe Public Safety will be playing a softball tournament to raise funds for school supplies, is my understanding, right? Time to be announced, but if you want to come see Amherst Fire Department be the champions, It'll be on June 25th. And I would also like to thank staff for cleaning uh, up a few things up at the courthouse, new flags, putting the railing back up very quick. So I appreciate you guys doing that. Now, would you like to make an announcement? Very good. Okay, so we are having a welcome reception for Jeremy in his new position um, immediately following the adjournment of this meeting. 
Back here behind us in the board meeting room beside the kitchen, we have some food set up and you are welcome to go help yourself and you can come back in here to mingle and talk um, while we take down everything from the meeting. So we hope you all can stay and join us for a little bit. Thank you. And there were three cakes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We had a really good time with the cakes. <laughs> So there's uh, three, and they're all already pre-cut, so that you cannot see what they looked like to begin with. <laughs> but uh, please join us. We are very fortunate to have uh, Mr. Bryant with us, and uh, let's just celebrate a little bit with him and staff. So thank you. Uh, board, if there is nothing else, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion on the floor by Mr. Ayers. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. I vote aye. We stand adjourned.